Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm just going to give you all a few more seconds to kind of um, filter in this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are joining from. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Chelsea Hackett. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the outreach coordinator in the JD admissions office. And you all are attending um, the Henderson Center for Social Justice info session that we are doing with admissions. Um, so I'm joined today by Savala Nolan um, and by Ashley, who's the program manager in the Henderson Center. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Savala to kind of give you a broad overview of the center and you know, what they do at Berkeley Law. Thank you, Chelsea. Hi, everybody. I am Savala Nolan, and I'm the executive director of the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at Berkeley Law. And I'm really happy to be hanging out with you today. I wish it was in person, but you know, this is how the cookie crumbles. So it will be better than nothing. I know we have about an hour together. I definitely do not wanna talk at you that whole time. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the center, you know, like maybe 15 minutes or so um, and what we do at the center. And then I would love to hear from you and hear, you know, your questions and answer them or field them as best as I can. You can go ahead and put your questions in the, um, Q&A box as I'm speaking, you know, feel free to just drop them in there and we will get back uh, or get to them a little bit later in our time together. So first things first, you should know that I am actually an alum of Berkeley Law. So uh, everything that I do and say as Henderson director um, sort of comes through that lens of having been through the process myself, granted over a decade ago, but law school doesn't change that quickly. Um, and Berkeley Law, you know, it's near and dear to my heart, both as an employee and as an alum. Um, and so I speak about Berkeley Law kind of with both of those hats on, and I'm happy to talk about my law school experience as well as the work that I'm doing right now. So what I'm gonna do, is tell you the role of the Henderson Center. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of the Henderson Center. Um, I'm gonna tell you about what we do. I'm gonna tell you a little tiny bit about what we don't do and the questions that I, I really can't speak to. Um, and then, and then you know, we will, we will converse more than me presenting. So the role of the Henderson Center for social justice is essentially to bridge a certain kind of gap that shows up in the law school experience for many students, particularly students who come into law school who um, either want to do social justice work or whose presence in the law school because they're part of a marginalized, underrepresented, under considered community implicate social justice issues. What many when else find when they come into law school is that um, they thought they were kind of going to justice school, you know, they thought that they were going to have um, a lot of time and space to talk about issues of belonging and subordination and power and privilege. Um, but in fact, that's not what they're spending their time doing as a 1L, because as a 1L, you are really charged with mastering the basics of the law, the, the sort of foundational bricks of the law. Um, and, and those foundational bricks, you will come to find out, are not really social justice oriented. Um, so there's this gap that emerges, and if the gap isn't addressed, right, the gap between kind of between what you thought you were going to be doing in law school and this passion to make the world a better place and, and like studying the rules of civil procedure, you know, and studying like arcane notions of property law, if that gap isn't addressed, it can be extremely alienating for students, um, and they can find themselves... Um, demoralized and like, you know, to the point of even wondering why they're in law school. So we exist first and foremost to address that gap. I'm sorry, my dog is going bananas. If she keeps going, unfortunately, I'm going to have to step away and get her, but maybe she'll calm down. 
Um, so we, we exist to bridge that gap and to help students hold on to the social justice energy that they brought to law school, like that they poured into their application, you know, um, and to help them build the skills that are necessary to do social justice work for the long haul. We've been at the law school in existence for, gosh, almost 25 years. That's amazing. Um, and we, we were created in response to Proposition 209. I won't get super technical on you, but it, it is, um, it's illuminating to understand the origin story of the center. Prop 209 was the California voter initiative from the 90s. It's still actually the law of the land. And when it passed, it made it illegal for, um, for basically for entities that get state money to consider race or gender uh, in, in their dealings. So in the context of a law school or UC, it ended affirmative action. And that's still the law of the land. Um, when affirmative action ended, the composition of the law school was drastically altered. We went from having oh gosh, something like 30 black 1Ls before the law was enacted to having one. And that one was someone who had actually deferred their admission. Now I have to mention here that um, of course the drop in numbers of black students in particular was not reflective of the intelligence or quality, so to speak, of the black students, right? It was because a curative um, tool, in other words, affirmative action had been removed, right? So like medicine that was meant to address a problem in the system was no longer available. In response to the changed composition of the law school, in response to the politics of the moment, four women at the law school, the dean and three professors, um, decided that what we really needed was not just a center that served the public interest, as important as the public interest is, but a center that was oriented toward and rooted in social justice, meaning a place um, with a pronounced political point of view with regard to questions of power and privilege and subordination and so on. Uh, Public interest and social justice very often overlap, right? But it's not a given. Um, for instance, you know, there were plenty of lawyers who were working in the Trump administration. They were doing public interest work. Government work is public interest work. Were they doing social justice work? I mean, that's a conversation for, for another time, but I think, um, it illustrates kind of the difference that I'm talking about and what makes the Henderson Center special is that we are steadfastly and overtly oriented toward thinking about the people with the least power, the least privilege. We are a space of social justice. So what do we do um, with that charge and with that origin story? We do a little bit of everything. We have a programmatic footprint um, or what you might think of as kind of an events and gatherings footprint. And that is in some ways the bread and butter of what we do because we're community focused, meaning the community within the law school primarily, we're student focused. So we do stuff for y'all uh, where you guys get to hang out where we get to hang out with you. Um, I will touch on two of the programs that we do that we do for one else because they're probably uh, more interesting to you than the things that we do with two L's and three L's in mind. So if you come to Berkeley Law and you're uh, looking to be engaged with the Henderson Center right away, you know, starting at the very beginning, we will invite you to come to our series of conversations called Core in Context. That refers to the core curriculum in a social justice context. And what we do in those chats is break bread, sit around a big table, and invite the professors who are teaching the Wendell classes, Civ Pro, Torts, Criminal Law, et cetera, property, um, to talk about their, their course in a social justice context, which is not generally what you're gonna get at the podium and in the casebook, 
for a variety of reasons, which I can't get into here, there's just often not space or time to dive really deep into how, you know, the rules of civil procedure um, implicate racial hierarchy or what they have to do with um, the rights of trans communities or the rights of women and so on and so forth. So that takes up about half the semester. And that's one of the first things that we do as a community where you all get to meet each other, you get to hang out with these professors in a uh, casual capacity, and we get to start the work of thinking about the law um, from a social justice perspective. The second set of programs that we would invite you to as a 1L is called Critical Foundations. Probably most of you, if you're following current events, have heard um, about the moral panic, the kerfuffle over CRT or critical race theory that's in the news. If we were in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hands or nod. But I'm assuming many of you are aware of that. Uh, you may also know that critical race theory is not something that can be taught in kindergarten. You know, it's very high level uh, legal thinking. And it's part of a whole body of thought, a whole literature, a whole set of research that seeks to critique the received wisdom of the law, very specifically around race in the case of critical race theory um, or gender, especially feminism around feminist jurisprudence. Um, there's sociology of law in that bucket that le looks very specific specifically at law as a tool of um, power and control on kind of a social level. There's queer theory. I mean, there's a whole, a whole beautiful menu of rich critical theory that you can use to, um, you know, vivify some of that social justice energy. The thing is, you're not going to get it as a 1L because these are sort of higher level, um, more complicated tools than what you than what you get in your prescribed curriculum. The Henderson Center offers a space to start learning the vocabulary of critiquing the law and like practice playing with it a little bit. Um, and we focus on CRT, feminist jurisprudence, and what's called sociology of law, which again is looking at how we use the law uh, for social control or how the law is used against us for social control, depending on your position and your perspective. The Henderson Center has an academic footprint. I teach a class with my colleague, Professor Patel, called uh, Movement Lawyering. And the course is built around the notion that whatever negative beliefs about identity you've absorbed are going to negatively impact your ability to be an effective social justice lawyer. They're either going to hamstring you, you know, if I'm if I have swallowed and incorporated and believed all of this, you know, anti-black, anti-fat misogynist things in the culture, then that's going to impact my ability to show up as an advocate. And it's also going to impact my ability to regard clients who, who might be fat or black or female um, with clarity. So we look at how identity plays a role in social justice learning in that class. And that's part of what the Henderson Center does as well. And that's a class for one else. We have a kind of financial footprint. We have a big old bucket of money that we give to students through an application process who are doing racial justice work um, during summers for the law school. So we support students that way. We have a research footprint um, that varies from producing white papers to doing kind of in-house research that really pertains to the law school. I'm so sorry about my dog. Ashley, if the dog is like ruining this whole thing, please put it in the chat so I can do something with her. I just don't want to step away from the computer unless I have to. Um, where was I? Oh, and then all of this, you know, wrapped up in all of this is mentorship and community, right? Um, through me, through other sort of Henderson Center students, you know, if you will. Um, and mentorship is a, is a really huge, you know, it's hard to quantify it, but it's a huge, um, 
it's a huge part of what I aim to do and what I want the center to provide is sort of peer to peer mentorship through community building. And then I, I can also serve as a mentor and I do to students. I wanna circle back um, to why any of this matters and uh, remind you to put questions in the chat. I'm gonna wrap up here in a few minutes or not the chat, sorry, in the Q and A. So why does any of this matter? Um, you don't know it yet. <laughs> well, maybe some of you know it if you have lawyers in your family or your paralegals or things like that. But what you will come to see with increasing clarity if you enroll in law school is that the law is actually a very conservative place. And I don't mean that uh, politically, I'm not talking about Republican, Democrat, you know, liberal conservative, I'm not talking about it that way. I just mean that it's very slow moving and it's tied to precedent. It's path dependent. I'm gonna unpack that a little bit cause I'm, you may not really know what I mean when I say that. Courts operate um, with huge respect for decisions that have come before them. So a court is inclined to follow whatever the court last said about this particular issue, even if that was 10 years ago, 50 years ago, right? There's a Latin name for this called stare decisis. That means let the decision stand. And what that means is that the law is um, predisposed to not rock the boat, right? It's path dependent, as I said, which means it doesn't wanna step off the path it's already on, right? Like it's current footsteps depend on footsteps that happened a long time ago. The other thing about the law is like, it's, it's obsessed with hierarchy, you know? And I, I get why, right? It's, it's built into the structure that we have a Supreme Court at the very top and that court has the final say. And below it, there are a few appellate courts that have less power than the Supreme Court, but more power than the trial courts. You know, it's, it's top down, right? And ultimately what the Supreme Court says, what this one body says is the law of the land. If you put those things together, if you layer them on top of each other, right? A very small concentration of power, hierarchy, and a tendency to not want to change, you can see what I mean when I say that the law is sort of an inherently conservative animal. And even a progressive law school like Berkeley um, is impacted by that, right? Because what we're teaching is the law. We're teaching you how this animal operates, right? We're teaching you its care and feeding. And so what you encounter in law school through the pedagogy, even at a very progressive space, is that um, if you are part of a group of people who has been historically or currently underrepresented, underconsidered, marginalized, um, you're not necessarily going to see your experience, your instincts, the validity of your existence, your concerns, um, reflected in the law school classroom. Even if your professors are progressive, you know, it's just the nature of the animal, especially as a 1L. Which means if you want to have a space that's not just dedicated to the public interest and the common good, as important, as crucial as that is, and as vibrant as that is at Berkeley Law, if you want to have a space that's not just about what's good for everybody, but about what's good for people who are far away from the power, right? Who have been shut out systematically over and over again, often using the law. Like if you want that space, you have to carve it out. You have to staff it. You have to fund it. Uh, you have to have a physical space for it. And the Henderson Center is all of those things. Not every law school has that. Not every law school has made the institutional commitment to the questions and the goals that we ask. Um, and that's why it matters that the Henderson Center is part of the law school and it's why we do what we do. Now, before I get to questions, 
Um, let me tell you what we don't do because it might inform the questions that you ask if you, if you indeed have any. We don't do advocacy in the form of pro bono, in the form of um, signing on to amicus briefs, or in the form of lobbying. There are places in the law school where that happens. Sometimes we work with them, but the Henderson Center, it's not our bag. It's not what we do, um, which means I can't really answer the questions you may have about pro bono or amicus briefs or you know policy work, um, as well as certain other people in the law school can be able to. The other thing that we don't do, and this kind of falls under pro bono, is SLIPs. Those are the student initiated legal service projects. And I know some of you are going to have questions about SLIPs because they're fabulous and it's rare to have that kind of access to client focused direct services work as a 1L. I just am not your expert on that topic because they're not run by the Henderson Center. Um, Oh, one other thing that I forgot to mention in the sort of bucket of things that we do, we administer the Public Interest and in Social Justice Certificate and the Race and Law Certificate. And I'm proud to say that we actually built the Race and Law Certificate um, in addition to administering it. And you can think of certificates as um, a demonstration that will show up on your transcripts that you have pursued um, academically, experientially in your writing, a sort of minor or a major, to use the undergraduate terms, um, within your legal education. So for race and law, you know, you've taken a certain number of courses about race and so on and so forth. Same with public interest and social justice. So that's something else we do. We help students um, earn those certificates. I think that I have said enough. I'm looking at the clock. I've been talking for 24 minutes. Aha, Chelsea points out that there's a pro bono program coming up next Wednesday. So that's the place to take your questions about pro bono and slips. But if there are other questions, um, let's hear them. Ashley, do you wanna, do you wanna read some? While well, you're reading the first one, I'm gonna close my door because of my dog. Yes, affirmative? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the first question we have is from Lily and Lily asks, I am planning on practicing public interest law in the Southeast United States. Can you tell me anything about how Berkeley slash the Henderson Center might support alumni that end up outside of the usual regional placements? Mm. Um, hey, Lily. I mean, my first thought is, I don't know if there are re usual regional placements. When you're talking about like a top school, the students go everywhere. Sure, like New York, San Francisco, LA, DC, they probably get more than some other places, but um, our network of alumni is really vast. And I can think off the top of my head of, gosh, 10 or 11 people in the last few years that have gone on to do um, public interest and social justice work in the Southeast. Part of the country. I don't know exactly what you mean by Southeast, but I'm thinking Florida, Louisiana, um, Virginia, Kentucky, the Carolinas, you know, in that realm. Um, the Henderson Center can support you through the mentorship and the connections that I have and that the center has with some of these students, you know, and it can support you um, more broadly just by helping to make you a better social justice advocate, right? And giving you a law school experience um, that will be nourishing and satisfying to you so that when you leave law school, you don't feel like, oh my gosh, I just endured this nightmare, you know? You feel energized and really enriched by what you just experienced for three years. So um, that I think is a very broad way of answering your question. But what I want to suggest that you do, Lily, is reach out to the career development office or the admissions office. Um, and they can help you see a little, a little better than I can, probably the nuts and bolts of who goes where. And especially CDO, career development, can talk you through 
how they connect current students with former students in different parts of the country. Um, I hope that answers your question. Let's go to the next one. And let me add, if I don't get to all the questions, you can always email me. I'm gonna put my chat, I mean, my uh, email in the chat again. Okay, next question. Um, sorry if I mispronounce your name, but this is from Rushika. Thank you so much for leading this session tonight. Could you speak more about the Henderson Center's research footprint? Sure. Um, hi, Rashika. That is a lovely question. Um, we have done a little bit of everything. <laughs> and Ashley, maybe you can pull up um, the research page and drop it in the chat so that Rashika or others can see um, examples of, you know, white papers and projects that we have done. I mean, they have truly run the gamut, including regionally. Um, two that come to my, you know, that come to my mind, although they predate me, but it have been really impactful, have to do with restorative justice um, in the Bay Area and truth and reconciliation work in the South. Um, as an executive director, I am less focused on research, you know, different executive directors, um, they exercise different prerogatives about where they want to put the resources of the center. My feeling is that there is so much incredible research going on through our faculty um, and frankly, our students that I am more inclined as an executive director to support that work um, than to put Henderson Center resources toward it, which can feel duplicative. So I'm more likely to be supporting a faculty member who is doing research in a particular area. That being said, um, two L's and three L's, not one L's, but two L's and three L's are eligible to um, apply for what's called the Koblenz Fellowship. Don't try to remember this. You'll get emails about it if you, if you enroll. And at, if through that fellowship, students can work with the Henderson Center or a number of other centers, getting either money or credit, depending on what they need to, to survive and graduate, um, helping with research projects. We have done Koblenz fellowships for inward facing research. Cause again, my, my emphasis at the Henderson Center is student facing facing into the law school rather than out of the law school. And the project that students helped us on was um, building out the race and law certificate, which, you know, there was like administrative work to be done. There was sort of the political work of um, how we frame that, you know, there's a lot of balancing to be done um, in terms of what what is a rigorous certificate, but not so rigorous that it can't be accomplished by anybody. I'll spare you the details, but through the Koblenz Fellowships um, is where you would probably be most likely to find research opportunities at the Henderson Center, as long as I'm executive director. But you should definitely peruse the webpage um, and it'll give you a feel for the kind of stuff that we're interested in and, and what we do when we're doing research. More okay. questions? Yes, I have a question from Cameron. Can you explain why the Henderson Center doesn't engage in the advocacy work you mentioned, like pro bono or briefs, et cetera? Um, yes, I can, but I just got so blurry. Am I blurry to you guys? Yes, you are. I have no idea why. And I am such a Luddite that I have no idea how to fix it. Um, I'm just going to plow ahead and we can pretend you're listening to a podcast, I guess. Ashley, do you know how to fix it? <laughs> Unless I somebody, have, if you don't know, then we'll just plow ahead. I have no idea how you did that, but I'll try to fix it on my end. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, who, who knows? So the question, the question was, why don't we do, um, why don't we do, uh, advocacy? I think that was the question. Um, 
I mean, the simple answer is that it's happening at the law school in really powerful and effective ways. And I'm not interested in duplicating what other folks are doing, right? If they're doing it really well, I'm happy to help, you know, um, happy to, um, you know, partner with some of the other centers or the clinics in particular that are doing this kind of work or the pro bono and field placement department. I mean, we work closely with them, but we don't spearhead those efforts. They just simply are not what the Henderson Center is about. We were imagined and built to be student facing. So um, our energy and our efforts are really focused on what it feels like to be at the law school as a social justice student or as a student whose presence in the law school implicates social justice issues because um, they're a person of color or they're part of some group that has traditionally been marginalized and undervalued in the law school setting. And the work that you're describing, pro bono, um, testifying before Congress, amicus briefs, all of that, it's incredibly important, it's essential it's also outward facing. It's not really about what it feels like to be a student. Um, it's not really about the experience of having conversations be part of everyday life at the law school that focus on some of these themes that I've been mentioning, privilege, subordination, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, there's not a big dramatic reason. It's just not what our brand, uh, brand with, it's not what our bread and butter or wheelhouse is. Um, but we are always in conversation with the folks who are exclusively focused on that, because as, as your question suggests, you know, there's definitely room for overlap and collaboration. Okay, we got a great tip from Tyler in the Q and A. Oh, um, they said if you turn your camera off and on, it should fix the blurriness. Well, that supposes that I know how to turn it off and on, like in the Zoom, like stop your okay. video and then turn it back on. <laughs> I'm telling you, I really am a luddite. Off. Oh, look at that. Yay. Thanks, Tyler. This is why I love my students. They just know so much more than I do. Thank you okay. for that. <laughs> okay. A question from Sassine. Again, sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Is it a goal of the center to get more students into public interest work after graduation? If so, how does the center work towards that goal? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Um, let me answer the second part of the question first, and then I'll circle back to the yes and no. Everything we do is designed to help students be prepared emotionally, intellectually, and interpersonally, and financially to go into a public interest career if that's what they want to do, if that's the right call for them, right? All of the events, symposium, conferences, the certificates, the scholarships, I mean, it's all meant to build your capacity to do that kind of work while you're at law school and beyond law school, if that's what you wanna do. And I'm not sure if you're using public interest as, as interchangeable with social justice. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of it that way, but you may have been drawing a particular line, but I'm gonna assume that you sort of are referring to them as the same thing. The yes and no, about whether or not it's a goal that more students or all students go into that line of work, um, that's more complicated because for some students, that's not the right line of work for them. You know, um, there are very, very good reasons to go to a law firm. For example, um, in my case, you know, I am from a line of generational poverty that basically goes back to chattel slavery, you know? And law school was the first opportunity, certainly in, you know, in my lifetime, that anyone in my family had to, to maybe claw out of that a little bit and start the process of amassing wealth. Now, from where I sit, that is a legitimate reason to go to a law firm 
for a period of time forever, right? Who we are is part of how we make these decisions, right? And we are allowed to pay attention to that and to place value on that, right? In addition to maybe the values we have of justice or access or so on and so forth. So more than wishing as the Henderson Center ED that every student or more students go into public interest and social justice work. I mean, yes, that would be beautiful, you know, but more than having that as a goal, what I want is for the students who know they wanna do that to be equipped to do it. And for the students who can't do that or, you know, aren't sure about that, you know, maybe it's a single parent with three kids. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people go towards the money after graduation. I want those students um, to have the same depth of capacity that we're trying to build in our sort of hardcore social justice, public interest, career driven students. I just, I really resist making judgments about why people choose the jobs that they choose, especially the first job after law school. You know, most lawyers are going to be doing the work for decades and your first job out of law school is just that. So yeah, if you do, if you end up going to a firm and becoming a partner, do I want you writing those checks to your former classmates who were doing direct services work, you know, on the other end of the city? Absolutely, but I'm not gonna judge where people um, need to go for their first job out of law school, as long as it's a considered thoughtful choice. I hope that makes sense. We are getting some really amazing questions in the chat. I'm not surprised. <laughs> A uh, question from Alice. I have heard about the Henderson Center Scholars. Can you give any insight into who can be selected and what benefits or opportunities they have access to? I can, Alice. Uh, you know, you, how do I, how do I say this? Applicants are considered, it's not up to you to apply, to tick a box. If you've demonstrated some kind of commitment to social justice or some interest in the Henderson Center, the admissions team considers you um, for the Henderson Scholars Program. Uh, only a small number of people get it, you know, but you're considered for it just by dint of having applied and having either set, there's a place you can say you're interested in the Henderson Center um, or having demonstrated, you know, social justice interest in your application in other ways. You could probably email admissions and ask them to, sorry, Chelsea. Um, but there's nothing you can do after you've applied to be considered. Um, the, Henderson, the Henderson scholars get, um, uh, what do they get? They get money, they get, they get $30,000 across law school for ten, so 10 each year of financial aid. Um, and they get certain um, kind of mentorship and cohort programmatic activities through me. So that's what the scholars get. But again, if you've applied, there's nothing else you need to do. Meaning if you've applied for admission to the law school, there's nothing else you need to do or can do to be considered for a, a center scholarship. Okay, we've got a question from Christine. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for putting on this webinar for us. Could you tell us which programs slash initiatives at the Henderson Center you enjoy most? Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like saying, what's your favorite Beatles song? I don't know, we do so many good things. Um, I, I, I adore the core in context and critical foundations because it's so tangible when you're in the room how much our 1Ls are craving these conversations. And that feels really good every year. The questions the students ask are mind opening for me. You know, even though I've been doing this for a while, I learn from hearing my colleagues, you know, their professors speak about these topics. So that's something that always feels really, really, really good. And I look forward to it every year. As soon as it's over, I'm looking forward to it again. The other thing that I love doing 
And I didn't really unpack this um, in my spiel, but you know, I'm getting to it now, is work with student affinity groups to support the vision that they have for what they want to do. Um, and that runs the gamut from a symposium, which is basically like a, a law school version of a conference, you know, where you bring in a bunch of speakers and there's panels and coffee and muffins in the morning and a keynote speaker, all of that. It's pretty common that a student group like the Women of Color Collective or Law Students of African Descent or Take Your Pick will come to the Henderson Center because of our political orientation and our institutional skill and resources and ask to partner with us to create a symposium or a workshop or something like that. And that's always tremendous fun. I mean, it feels really good to be able to funnel our resources to student groups in support of their vision. The professor in me loves seeing students learn in action, right? You know, learning happens when old information, you can connect it with new information, right? Like that's the sweet spot where it's like, ah, oh, I'm learning. You're connecting what you already know to new information. And that's what happens with students. And frankly, with myself, when we're partnering with these affinity groups, and it's also what happens in the one all programming. So um, the commonality here is I love working with students. I absolutely adore working with students. Okay, we have another question from Alice. I have heard a little about Berkeley Law students effort to get CRT included in the 1L curriculum. What has that activism looked like? And in general, what type of feedback and input do students tend to have into the learning experience at Berkeley Law? Mm. Um, the question about what sort of feedback students have into the learning experience is such a massive question, and it's a really good question. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, is because I'm on the, I sit on the um, equity and inclusion committee, which is a committee the Dean pulls together and, uh, you know, tasks with focusing on generally student facing, facing issues of equity and inclusion, which generally pop up in the classroom, although of course they can pop up elsewhere. Um, Berkeley Law, our student is a place where students are vocal and bright and engaged writ large. So they are almost always offering feedback about the education that they're receiving and that they're engaged in. Some of that feedback is actionable. Some of it isn't, right? Um, so rather than dive into like the specifics of the, the ways that they have impact, what I will say is that um, there's an ongoing, very complicated conversation about how to give students more of what they are saying they need and want given the fact that student bodies change all the time. You know, there's always graduating students, there's always new students, and the students that come in after you may not want what you want, right? So um, the institution cannot pivot every time students ask for something. It's, it's not structurally possible. Um, what you will also find is that students are often asking for, at least social justice oriented students, are often asking for resources that most easily come from faculty of color and women faculty and women of color faculty. And there's a very real concern about asking that particular cohort of faculty to do kind of even more than other faculty may be doing in order to meet the understandable and legitimate needs of the student body. I'm mentioning this kind of framework because I'm hoping rather than to sort of give you an easy answer to your question, to give you a sense of the complexity 
of the terrain on which these conversations happen, right? And part of what you'll learn in law school is how to, how to think through these very complex balancing acts um, where resources are limited, time is limited, and needs are valid. So these conversations are happening and they're complicated. And if you wanna talk more offline, you should email me. As far as CRT goes, you know, I have not been part of the push. It's been a student-led effort. I've, of course, been in conversations with the students and um, have very happily reviewed some of the drafts of the memos that they submitted to the dean and to the faculty and kind of offered my two cents about what they were saying and how they were saying it. Um, I am in favor of CRT or something equivalent being a required part of the 1L curriculum. Um, it's not my call. It's just not my call. But, you know, rest assured, you better believe that part of why I pushed for the race and law certificate a few years ago was to begin to like, well, not begin, but to continue pushing this ball around having race um, not viewed as a footnote in legal education, but understood to be at the core of the law in the United States um, was to keep that ball moving. So I, I hope that gives you a, a something like an answer. And if it doesn't, you know, feel free to email me and we can talk offline. Okay, if you had to estimate what percentage of the 1L class participates in the core and context sessions every year? Oh boy, percentage. I'm so bad at math. Let's see, how many 1Ls did we have last year? Or in a typical year, 300? Chelsea, are you still on the call? I want to say 300. Yeah, 325. 325. Okay. Um, and it, you know, the last couple years have been weird because of COVID and we haven't been in person and all that. But in a typical year, um, we're at standing room only. So like between 60 and 75, 80 students at each session. So, um, you know, given that people have different interests and given that there are like many events happening every single day um, at lunchtime, and that's when we have our events, you know, a, a sizable chunk of the one all class. More questions? Ashley, are you there? Yeah, we have one question from Matthew, but I okay. think this might be a better question for Chelsea. Um, does the center have any resources for students whose first language is not English? Also, does the center have any resources for students who would like to improve their skills in a foreign language? for example, Spanish during their time at the law school? Well, I can say no, the center does not offer that resource. Although there, there have historically been classes, Chelsea, you may know more about this than me, like Spanish for lawyers, you know? Um, yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Chelsea, just, you know, haven't offered my two minor cents. Right. Yeah. So you're right. So sometimes we'll have classes like Spanish for lawyers, but um, also you're able to take classes outside of the law school. And in particular, you could take language courses as long as you kind of petition to the Dean of Students that that would help you in your career as a lawyer. Um, that would be for getting credit for them for those courses. But of course, you could also just ask professors at UC Berkeley um, to audit courses. Do you think those will be helpful for you? Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Okay, we currently have no open questions. Oh, we just received one from Tori. Does okay. the Henderson Center work with the admissions team to build a welcoming, inclusive environment for underrepresented, underrepresented students? If so, how? Sorry, you cut out for just a second. It was, does the Henderson Center work with something, something inclusive environment? Does the Henderson Center work with the admissions team to build oh. a welcoming, inclusive environment? 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind. I mean, everything the Henderson Center does is kind of, is it's pointing towards having an inclusive environment um, for all students and especially students who are underrepresented uh, and under considered in the legal profession in the law school space. I, we don't have a say in who is admitted to the law school. So we don't, we don't work with admissions in terms of like numbers or, or like ensuring a certain level or type of diversity. Um, but as far as, you know, welcoming students or prospective students, yeah, I mean, we do things with admissions all the time, such as this. Uh, and then everything that we do with or without admissions is about um, creating the type of environment that, that you're naming. Um, I feel like I'm not really answering the question even though I'm trying to. I don't know if Chelsea, if you wanna weigh in or if you just wanna reach out to me individually, but yeah, I think I think we do we do everything we can do given that we are not part of admissions. Uh, I have nothing else to add. Um, okay, but you're welcome to reach out and continue that conversation. If you yeah, if there are specific things that you like have in mind, you know, I'm totally happy to talk about them um, or hear ideas for that matter. Okay, can you speak to how the center or the law school overall supports students who are looking to stay in academia after law school or do law research? Mm, oh yeah, um, I have. I don't know why I have a soft spot in my heart for people who want to do academia, but I do. Um, and what I want to encourage whoever asked this question, I didn't. I didn't get your name. What I want to encourage you to do is. Um, definitely talk to the career development office because they in particular do programs about sort of different career tracks. And among those tracks is of course, people who wanna go into academia or who wanna write or who wanna be focused on research with their law degree. And that's with or without a PhD, right? So there's there's a, there's a thing called a JSP program, which is where you get your law degree and your PhD. And it's kind of tailor-made for people who wanna go into a certain type of academia. Um, so reach out to the career development office. You could also reach out to the JSP program um, to see what they do. And the reason I'm kind of pointing you outside the center is because we don't, um, you know, we're not a career development office, right? Like we can't necessarily um, provide the kind of concrete or kind of well-worn path that you might be looking for. What we can do is provide mentorship, fellowship, capacity building, skill building, um, connections to professors who are doing the kind of work that you want to do, um, introductions, things like that. We are less focused on a particular kind of job that you might have and more on making sure that whatever job you go into, you have internalized the grammar and the vocabulary to keep social justice questions at the forefront of what you're doing if you want them to be there. Does that make sense? So it's less about guiding you towards a certain career and more about enhancing your ability to do that career in service of social justice values, whatever the career may be. I hope that's helpful. All right, another question from Alice. Does the center have any influence on recruiting and hiring faculty of diverse backgrounds? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, as the center director and as someone who lectures at the law school, um, I have a certain amount of institutional power for lack of a better word. I mean, I don't wanna overstate the power, right? but I have a voice um, 
and I have a spot on the equity and inclusion committee, you know, I have the dean's ear to communicate. Am I personally involved in hiring decisions? No, not for faculty. Um, does the Henderson Center take a formal stance on whether to extend an offer to a particular person? No, not our role. But do we, um, can we and do we speak to the people who actually have the right and responsibility to make those decisions about um, curricular gaps, you know, that, that could be addressed through hiring um, from particular pools of candidates or beyond particular pools of candidates um, to talk about equity and inclusion in the classroom and how who gets hired impacts that to talk about um, the burden that professors feel who are tasked with, you know, mentorship in ways that others are, you know, like if there's one, let's say black faculty member, which there isn't, but if there's one, they're gonna be asked to do a lot of mentorship probably from black students, right? And it can easily become like too much. So. I'm not in a position to make those decisions and the center is not in a position to make those decisions, but like, are we in conversations with the people that make them? Sure. Do they want our opinion? Absolutely. You know, I'm also on the social justice curriculum committee, which means thinking about who teaches social justice courses, which courses are offered, what we need to have offered that we're not currently offering, how we can make sure that teaching loads are fair and we're not saddling you know, professors of color with all the classes about race, you know, these types of questions. So yes, we're involved. No, we are not the final decision makers, but yes, we're involved. Okay, we currently do not have any open questions and it is 4.59. All right, perfect timing. Well done, everyone. Uh, it's been my pleasure to chat with you. I hope you're getting a feel for Berkeley Law as you come to these sessions and how bright and warm and wonderful the people are. Not talking about myself, just the people in general. Uh, you have my email. Feel free to reach out. Happy to chat with you more and best of luck in making your decision about law school. I think that's a wrap, Chelsea. Is that right? Yes, thank you so much. I'll be sending out this recording in case you missed anything and it'll live up on our website. But um, we hope to see you at future info sessions and we hope to see your applications soon. All right. Have a good Perfect. one. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.